and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. We say it every episode because we really mean it. Thank you to our supporters. We really couldn't keep doing this without you. Yes, thank you sincerely. And those of you who have considered becoming supporters, well, consider it harder. We'd love to make these episodes on a more consistent basis, but we need more support to make that happen. Yes, if you're not yet a supporter, look us up on Locals or Patreon to see our support levels and the perks offered. You can get details about becoming a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also, thank you for the reviews you leave on Apple and especially those five-star ratings. They really help others to find us. Yes, so all that said, on with the show. Today, Memorial Day, we're continuing what's become a tradition for us talking about a war chaplain. In this case, we're talking about Father Joseph T. O'Callaghan, S.J. Father O'Callaghan was the first Jesuit to serve as a military chaplain, and he was the first Catholic priest to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And after receiving his Medal of Honor, he went back to the classroom to teach mathematics and philosophy. I mean, talk about commanding respect from your students. (laughs) Seriously. Every story of heroism that leads to a Medal of Honor is just a jaw-dropping, heart-stopping tale of heroism and self-sacrifice. That's why so many recipients receive the honor posthumously. And Father O'Callaghan story is no different. What he did that awful day on the USS Franklin, that day that it was bombed, it was just amazing. Yeah. Learning about his actions, you just wonder if he more or less thought, well, I could be killed at any moment, so I might as well just keep doing the next thing that could possibly save lives and save the ship. And we'll see what happens. And the amazing thing is, against the odds, they did save the ship and likely, well, definitely hundreds of lives. Yeah, absolutely. So... Well, let's tell the story. Sure. So, Joseph Timothy O'Callaghan was born in Boston in 1905. He was born and raised Catholic, as his Irish name and Boston upbringing might suggest, and he decided at an early age to pursue a life of service as a Jesuit. Immediately upon graduating from high school in 1922, he entered the Society of Jesus. His training, naturally, took many years. His degrees were in physics and mathematics to go along with the philosophy and theology that all Jesuits study. He was sent to Boston College in 1927. There he taught mathematics, physics, and philosophy for 10 years. During that time, in 1934, he was ordained a priest. He taught philosophy for one year at Weston Jesuit School of Theology, and then in 1938, he was sent to the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is near my hometown. Yes. He was named the head of the mathematics department in 1940, but by this point, of course, the clouds of war had been darkened over Europe. He predicted that the U.S. would eventually be drawn into the war, and he felt a call to bring Christ to those who would be fighting. So in 1940, he applied for the Navy Chaplain Corps. And side note, I'm wearing one of my Navy Chaplain t-shirts that says, has a picture of an aircraft carrier on the back, and it says, small town seeking parish priest. Got it when I was a chaplain candidate back in seminary. Right, because Tom was a chaplain candidate when he was at Mount St. Mary's. But back to Father... O'Callaghan. Joseph T. O'Callaghan. He actually was a chaplain. Yeah. <laughs> Father O'Callaghan's friends and relations thought that being a chaplain was a bad move. He was a man of a tense, nervous disposition. He had high blood pressure and he was claustrophobic. Not a good mix for life aboard a ship. No. His friends also tried to convince him that his obvious gifts in teaching mathematics and physics should be kept at Holy Cross. Holy Cross was becoming a leading ROTC school, so his contributions could help the war effort in that way. But their arguments were useless. He was determined. And he received his commission on August 7, 1940. His first station was at Naval Air Station Pensacola, where he was, oddly enough, assigned to teach calculus. This was not what he had signed up for. He wanted to be in the fight. But he had to endure shore duty for 18 long months before finally getting his first on-ship assignment. This was on the aircraft carrier USS Ranger. While he was aboard the Ranger, that ship saw action up and down the Atlantic and in the Mediterranean. The Ranger played a key role in Operation Torch, which was the Allied invasion of North Africa. In 1944, he was assigned to a base in Hawaii, which was a bit of a rest assignment for him. 
But his rest wouldn't be long. In 1945, he received orders to join the crew of the aircraft carrier USS Franklin. The Franklin was operating in the Pacific Theater, and it was on this ship where his life would change. The Franklin had been in Pearl Harbor for repairs after being badly damaged at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Chaplain O'Callaghan reported for duty on March 2, 1945, and the Franklin, Big Ben as she was called, steamed out of harbor the next day, March 3rd. Their mission was to seek out and destroy what remained of the Japanese Navy after the Battle of the Philippines. Eleven days later, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, Father O'Callaghan gave a sermon in which he said, We do not want to avoid battle. We are looking for it. Hence, the proper prayer should be to ask for God's help for this, that while in the fray, we might do as good a job as possible for God and country. That day, he gave general absolution to the Catholics among the crew in preparation for the next day's actions. It would be the last time he gave general absolution. The next day, the Franklin came within 50 miles of the coast of Japan near Kobe. Their mission was to soften the defenses in preparation for an invasion of Okinawa. Their missions went well on March 18th, but the alert level was, of course, high. That night, however, the captain of the ship, Leslie Garris, reduced the alert level one notch to allow the men to get some additional sleep and chow. It was an odd decision considering the action of the day and their nearness to the Japanese mainland, and it was a decision that likely cost many hundreds of lives. In the early hours of March 19th, the Solemnity of St. Joseph Father O'Callaghan's patron saint, providentially. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an interesting tidbit. God may be subtly signaling the means of the ship's salvation. Yeah, who knows? But in the early hours of that day, a lone Japanese fighter plane dipped down out of the clouds. It had avoided radar by staying in the clouds so long, and then it dropped to an altitude of a mere 75 feet and skimmed across the water. As it flew over the Franklin, it dropped one semi-armor-piercing bomb which made a direct hit on the middle of the flight deck and crashed through into the hangar bay below. The plane looped back and dropped a second bomb in the aft section of the ship, also a direct hit, also penetrating through. The hits were about as good as the pilot could possibly have hoped. At the time, many planes were on the flight deck and in the hangar bay in various stages of being fueled and armed. The explosions of the two bombs set off a chain reaction of explosions and ignited fireballs from the gas tanks that were all over the place. Hundreds of men died almost instantly in the initial explosions and inferno. The ship was rocked from bow to stern. Father O'Callaghan was at breakfast at the time. He hit the deck as the glass from the lights overhead rained down. Smoke quickly filled the corridors, but Father O'Callaghan and other officers groped their way to the flight deck. There they got their first look at the horror. Flame erupting from below deck. Planes on the flight deck in flames. Twisted metal. Men's bodies. Some still alive and writhing in pain all over the place. Father O'Callaghan went into action first to aid the injured and administer last rites. But as he labored, he realized that the danger to those still living was far from over. Many more tons of ammunition and fuel was below deck and in the gun turrets. If those were to detonate, the ship would rip into pieces and all aboard would die horribly. So he kicked into action. Seeing some men who were basically paralyzed with fear, he said, Lads, lads, do you want to save our happy home? And they followed him. He organized them into firefighting parties. He helped them with fire hoses. When he realized the danger of the shells and the turrets exploding, he organized a fire brigade, and he personally entered the turret, gingerly picking up each of the explosive projectiles and ammunition packs and passing them along the line so they could be dumped overboard. The first man in the line clipped to Father O'Callaghan, Padre, praise the Lord, and dump the ammunition. I love it. Gallo's humor. As they were working, the ship began to list to starboard, and a 500-pound bomb near them began to roll toward a hole in the deck. If that bomb went through the hole, it would detonate, and they would all die. Six men ran over and stopped it rolling, but the officers nearby were too nervous to defuse the bomb. Father O'Callaghan walked over, straddled the bomb to steady it, and folded his arms. The men regained their composure and successfully defused it. After a time, Father O'Callaghan led men down into the smoke-filled corridors to save the magazines. 
again. If they were overheated, they would explode and that would tear the ship into pieces and kill them all. So he led the men into the chaos. They groped their way through the flames, smoke and hot twisted metal to the magazine where they used fire hoses to cool everything down. During this time, more Japanese planes came along and strafed the crippled ship. Father O'Callaghan apparently ignored those strafing runs, which prompted the ship's captain to ask him, Why don't you duck? To which Father O'Callaghan replied, God won't let me go until he's ready. So, well, there you have it. Just keep doing the next thing that needs doing until you die. I mean... (laughs) It's an interesting (laughs) philosophy for life. Yeah, right. Hmm. Well, but in the situation that he was in, that really was living one second to the next. Yeah. The fight to save the ship lasted for 11 harrowing, exhausting hours. But after those 11 hours, it was clear the ship was saved. She would not sink. Those still aboard would not die in a final cataclysmic explosion and inferno. But the death toll was still enormous. More than 800 killed, nearly 500 wounded. Of the roughly 1,500 men aboard the Franklin, 706 survived. The only ship in the entirety of World War II that suffered more casualties was the USS Arizona, you know, the one resting on the floor of Pearl Harbor. Just astounding. And it was the only ship to survive that had that many casualties. The Franklin was able to make it to a tiny island in the Pacific for emergency repairs, then on to Hawaii before heading to Brooklyn, New York, for the massive repairs. Father O'Callaghan remained ever the model of a Navy chaplain. He maintained his center in Christ, and from that center was able to offer counsel, encouragement, and even some humor into the lives of his men. Yeah. One great example, and I could just I could just picture this. When the Franklin steamed back into Pearl Harbor on April 3rd, which was exactly one month to the day since she'd left, Father had organized a group of the men into a makeshift band with instruments made from whatever they could put together. They greeted the folks of Pearl Harbor, who were horrified to see the condition of this ship that they had sent off in good condition just one month previously. They, ser- they were serenading them with a stirring rendition of the old Big Ben. She ain't what she used to be. Ain't what she used to be. Ain't what she used to be. I, I just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, awesome. <laughs> Considering those folks had just sent her off, they must have had big smiles or, you know, through the tears. The Franklin would see service again, but no more battles. She was done. And her chaplain, who was one of the men chiefly responsible for saving her, would not return to sea with her. In Brooklyn, awards were handed out in a ceremony on deck. 388 awards were handed out that day, the most ever given to the personnel of a single ship in U.S. Navy history. Father O'Callaghan's mother was at the ceremony. The ship's captain, Leslie Garris, approached her and said that her son was the bravest man he'd ever known. When Father O'Callaghan heard that he'd said that, he replied, Any priest, in like circumstances, should do and would do what I did. That is a lovely thought. Not sure it's entirely true, but would that all priests would aspire to that. Absolutely. (laughs) Oof. Anyhow, one award that was not bestowed that day on the deck of the Franklin was a Navy Cross to Father O'Callaghan. It was approved for him, but he refused it. Now, it seems he refused it because he didn't want any accolade for his actions that day. But the fact that it was a Navy Cross rather than a Medal of Honor had some politics behind it. It seems that Captain Garris was under heavy scrutiny for his actions that day and in other cases leading up to it. The belief is that Father O'Callaghan and at least one other who deserved medals of honor were only granted Navy crosses because that's all that Captain Garris was awarded and it wouldn't be right to give them higher awards than the captain received. But whatever the reason, Father O'Callaghan refused it. However, when word of his heroism got out and that he was only awarded a Navy cross and that he refused it, There was a public outcry, so much so that the matter got the attention of President Harry Truman. Truman personally looked into the matter, pressed to upgrade the Navy Cross awarded to Father O'Callaghan to a Medal of Honor, and he made it happen. 
And as an important side note, at the same time, Truman did the same thing for the Navy Cross of another officer of the Franklin, Lieutenant J.G. Donald Gary. Gary's actions that day directly saved hundreds of lives as well, and he was every bit as deserving as Father O'Callaghan. Right. So President Truman righted both wrongs, prevailed upon the still reluctant Father O'Callaghan to accept the Blue Max, and he presented both men with their medals of honor on January 23rd, 1946, in the Oval Office. Father O'Callaghan would leave the Navy in November of 1946 and return to Holy Cross College. He resumed his post as head of the mathematics department, and he went back to teaching math and physics. Again, imagine having him as a professor. My goodness. (laughs) He remained at Holy Cross, though he wanted to go be a missionary in Japan. Be because why not? (laughs) However, that harrowing 11 hours aboard the Franklin had a permanent effect. His health, both physical and mental, could not bear the strain. Even being a professor proved to be too much a challenge. Yes. In 1949, he suffered a stroke, which left his right arm paralyzed and forced him to abandon teaching. But the same perseverance that led him through the ordeal on ship led him to work hour by hour, day by day, to regain some use of that arm and work toward returning to the classroom. Two films were made about his actions, Battle Stations and Sage of the Franklin, and in 1961 he published his memoirs, I Was Chaplain on the Franklin. His last few years were spent largely in peace as his health seemed to improve and his spirits rose. But on March 17, 1964, St. Patrick's Day again, he suffered another stroke. This one seemed to indicate the end was near. It was 19 years since he'd given that final general absolution aboard the Franklin. The evening of the next day, that is, the vigil of the Solemnity of St. Joseph, he died quietly. He was only 58 years old. His mother, 90 years old and riding in a wheelchair, attended his funeral and burial at his beloved Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. Father O'Callaghan's Medal of Honor is kept in the archives at Holy Cross, but his legacy lives on in the families of the men he saved that day and the souls of those who died with the sacraments he provided. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our weekly newsletter, learn more about Father Joseph T. O'Callaghan, plus see about our pilgrimages, like our upcoming pilgrimage to the Catholic Holy Land in... Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. Catholic Holy Land. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Whichever Holy Land you're going to go to with us, the deadline to sign up is July 11th is because whole... it's coming up in August. This is the Holy Land that's suffused with bourbon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and find other great stories from American Catholic history. That's staying Did I in. say July 11th? You did. June 11th. June 11th. <laughs> Boy, we're doing great. This is all staying in. June 11th, deadline to sign up. Don't miss it. It's awesome. That's right. We also love the great reviews our listeners leave. Those and the five-star ratings help others to find us, help to push us up in those Apple ratings so that people see we're an awesome podcast. You can also email us feedback, questions, tips for episode topics, and other comments at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, and follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. <laughs> Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you.